morning, City Church. Let's worship together this morning.
God who breaks, who breaks the power of sin and darkness, who love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace.
full imagery in these lyrics, displaying your worth to us, Jesus. God, we thank you so much, as like we sang in the second song, of your amazing grace that was poured out for us, God. We thank you so much for life. We thank you so much for the joy in our lives. God, we know that the source of our joy comes from you and you alone. And God, we give you the praise this morning for everything that is due. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Ah, well, good morning and happy summer, everybody. You know, I feel obligated to say as a native Floridian, you know, it's, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Um, so I, I don't even know if that's true. I kind of feel like 97 degrees is part of the problem, um, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Hope you'll grab your Bible as we uh, jump into Acts chapter 5 this morning. You know, it's hard to know fakes from reals. Doesn't matter what it is, whether we are talking about fake purses or fake people, sometimes the fakes can be so good, even the experts can't tell. Whenever we buy something on Marketplace or Craigslist, we assume they are trying to rip us off. Am I right? We assume someone is lying. When a politician holds a press conference, we assume they are not telling the whole truth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we see church programs on TV, and we're pretty sure that a whole bunch of those folks are phonies. And even though these are difficult realities to accept, none of these change the fact that God has called us to be who we say we are. God has called us to be who we say we are. And Jesus had a name for people who are not what they appear to be. You remember that name? It's the word hypocrite. And this is something you probably didn't know. Did you know that Jesus is the only person in the New Testament to use the word hypocrite? It's one of his favorite words. I guess it's a favorite word, however we want to say that. It's a word that he uses a lot. Um, in classical Greek, hypocrite meant an actor, someone on a stage. And yet Jesus was the first one. This will show you the brilliance and the genius of Jesus. Jesus was the first person to take the word hypocrite and to bring it into the religious world and use it in a moral context. And it was a key point of his teaching because, and he addressed it again and again because he knew how deceptive the human heart can be. Now, by virtue of its very nature, by virtue of its very nature, the church will have both real and fakes. And it's nearly impossible to distinguish one from the other. I said sometimes that the fakes are so good that even the experts can't tell. Today's scripture teaches us that God can always tell. God can always tell the real from the phonies. There are no secrets with a living God. Now, today's story is a frightful one. It's about a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And just hearing those words might give some of you like the heebie-jeebies because you know what's coming in this story. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who on the outside look one way, but on the inside are actually something else, something different. And so we end chapter 4 with a guy named Barnabas, and Barnabas sells a piece of property. He brings the money to the apostles, and then at the beginning of chapter 5, we read about Ananias and Sapphira, and they appear to be doing the same thing, selling a piece of property and bringing it to the church. But we learn that deep in their heart lingers a love of money and a desire for the praise of people. And so they conspire together to present a portion of the money to the church and keep some of the money back, but they're going to pass it off as if they're giving all of the money to the church. And so it looks very similar to what Barnabas just did, but it's actually worlds apart. So beginning actually at the end of Acts 4... Verse 36, 
We need to read these last two verses. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus. Now, Joseph is his Hebrew name. That's the name that he would have been called around the house. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So that's a nickname that he's been given by all of his brothers and sisters in Christ, his church friends. He's Joe at home, but when he's at church, he's Mr. Positive, right? This is, uh, I love, I think it was the message where Eugene Peterson translates him, Barney the Encourager. Um, That's like, that's his nickname. Probably not the best nickname. But he sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And we've read already how it was quite common among the early Christ followers to be so incredibly generous that from time to time, someone would sell a piece of property or something significant. They would bring the money to the church to be used in its ministry. And it appears here that Barnabas is doing just that. And Barnabas is one of the heroes of the early church. You can imagine this group of people that... Their, their, their community is growing, but everything is brand new. Things are not exactly perfect because everyone's not super happy about them. And you can imagine when he did this incredible gesture, the kind of impact it would have made. Probably there would have been a celebration, uh, an eruption of celebration, a ripple effect of encouragement. And you can also imagine that Barnabas probably got a lot of compliments A lot of praise. What a guy. Man, he sold that property and gave all that money to the church. Wow. Man, I'd love to do that. Talk about generous. You can imagine the kind of sort of ripple effect. And that leads us to chapter 5. And the chapter division between chapter 4 and chapter 5 is unfortunate. Now, you recognize that the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not part of scripture. That's just something that we use in our Bibles for organizational purposes. And so it's kind of unfortunate because a lot of t- a lot of us n- have never read chapter 4 and chapter 5, the example of Barnabas and the story of Ananias and Sapphira, the way that Luke intended us to read them, and that is he intended us to read those together. We're supposed to understand like here's one example of generosity and here's another. And so The Acts 5 is a difficult story. It makes you uncomfortable. It presses in on us. It's sort of a miracle story, but not one of the happy miracles. (laughs) This is is one of the sobering miracles. And so in chapter 5, verse 1, we read, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira. Ananias means God is gracious. Sapphira means beautiful one. A man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property, just like Barnabas did. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So it's a big public demonstration of generosity, isn't it? And then Peter said, Ananias... How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you have received for the land? Now, as we've been reading through Acts so far, we have constantly seen God's people filled by the Holy Spirit. Over and over again, we read of someone filled by God's Spirit. They overflow with power. They live in generosity. But now we see someone not filled by God's Spirit, but filled by Satan, filled by evil. To be filled means to be under the influence of, to be empowered by. It's a a picture of a sail being filled with wind. And so the boat is what? Under the influence of the wind. It's, it's, It's empowered by the wind, and this is what's happening. And we see what happens when we are influenced and manipulated by Satan. Verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Yep. And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Yep. What made you think of doing such a thing? 
In other words, Ananias and Sapphira's deception was completely voluntary. It was their property to do with as they wished. No one expected them or required them to give it all. No one said they had to, had to give everything. They could have given a portion. In other words, Luke is letting us know there was no reason for them to lie. I think folks would have been probably pretty happy if they had said, we sold the property. We're going to give half of it to the church. Wow, half of it. So there's no reason for the deception. You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Ananias, you're not only being deceptive, you're being foolish. If you think that God believes your charade, if you think that God is fooled by this little parade of generosity, God is no fool. As Paul says, God will not be mocked. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And we don't really understand the cause of death. Some people suggest that maybe it was just the shock and the shame that killed him. We're not told that he had a heart attack or anything like that. It seems to be, as I read this story, that it's the result of God's judgment. It's God who deals with the guilty. And God confronts uh, him with the truth. But, or Peter confronts him with the truth. But it's God that delivers the judgment. And then you read... And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And I, I bet it did. Then some young men came forward, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. So Ananias, in the middle of the church service, brings this offering, lays it before the church. He's exposed as being dishonest. And when he's exposed, he dies right there in front of everyone. And some young men came in, and they haul his body out to go and bury him, which seems sort of cold-blooded. I mean, that's cold, is it not? Like, no funeral? <laughs> You're not going to call his family and let him know? Nope, no funeral for you. Um, and for those of you that don't understand, that was a pop culture reference back from the 90s. Um, <laughs> An honorable burial was really important in the ancient Near East. And so we have a situation where non-family members are burying this man without notifying his family. And the implication is that Ananias is not a person to be mourned. He is a rebel. He is an apostate. He is a criminal condemned to death. He should be buried quickly, without ceremony, without tears, and without honor. It is sobering. Verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? So Sapphira is given the opportunity to either corroborate her husband's story or to falsify it. Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And so we have this prophetic word from Peter that the very thing that happened to your husband will happen to you. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her by her husband. So Ananias and Sapphira, united in their conspiracy, now united in their judgment. And then verse 11, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And I again say, I imagine that it did. They must have been looking at one another and saying, this God, Yahweh, does not play religious games. So now it's time for us to examine what we've sort of dug up in this passage. And what I want to share with you today are five truths that I think move us toward authenticity. When we talk about the reals and the fakes, I think there's five truths here that move us and motivate us, and inspire us, and cause us to long and desire to be more real, to be real before God and before others. 
Number one, we see the difference a genuine life of faith can make. We see the difference a genuine life of faith can make. Never underestimate the amazing impact a regular, everyday, ordinary person can make in this world when they follow Jesus. That is Barnabas. That is Barnabas. Almost every time you see Barnabas, he is stepping up to the plate for the church in remarkable ways. When Saul, who will become the apostle Paul, has his conversion, the apostles are hesitant to accept him. And who is it who vouched for Paul and was the reconciler? It was Barnabas that went to him and said, you need to listen to this man. God has done a work in his life. When the believers in Antioch were struggling. Now, the center of the church started in Jerusalem, but it's going to move to Antioch. That's going to become the center of operations for the missionary work of the early church. But when those believers were struggling, who did they send to go down and encourage them and organize them and get them on track? They sent Barnabas. When the church was sending out its first missionary journey, Who did they lay hands on and pray over and send out with the gospel for the very first time? It was Paul and Barnabas. And you read about these over and over again where Barnabas is constantly behind the scenes making a difference in the lives of people with his incredible spirit and his selfless concern for others. And so when we read later on in Acts that the church, they have turned the world upside down, it was because of people like Barnabas who celebrated God's generosity by themselves being generous. See, I, I think every church needs a bullpen of Barnabases, a bullpen of believers like Barnabas. Now, for those of you that are not baseball fans, in baseball, you have a team. You got nine players on the field, but then you've got a dugout, and the dugout is all the players not in the game. Now, part of the dugout, usually over on the side, there's another group, there's another little dugout over there of pitchers. That's called the bullpen. These are the players who don't know if they're going to go in the game or not. Depends on how the game goes. And so when things Something gets needed in the game. The game gets tight. The situation gets tense. The starting pitcher starts to struggle. They know they might be called on to step into the game. And so that is what I think we see Barnabas doing. Every time there's a struggle, every time there's tension in the church, Barnabas is called in to be the one to smooth things out and keep the Lord's work going. One of the most generous people I've ever known was a prison guard named Greg. Just a regular day, ordinary person, but I was always amazed at how he was constantly giving so sacrificially to people and to people in need. One day, it was just a regular afternoon in the summer, and we were in the church parking lot talking about something, and a family pulled up in a car. I didn't recognize these people, but I met them. Uh, The dad came over and started talking to me and Greg, and um, he shared with us. He was looking for some financial help. They were locals. They lived locally. They had a small house, and they they didn't have any central air conditioning, but they had fans in their windows. This is Louisiana. This is really hot, and he was trying to find somebody who could help him buy some more fans, and... Uh, Greg said, let me, let me take him over here, and I'll, I'll get it taken care of. We'll go over to Ace Hardware. And so, you know, I, I didn't give it another thought. I talked to him later. Hey, did you get them taken care of? They're taken care of. Don't worry about it. It wasn't until later that I found out he didn't go to the hardware store and buy them fans. He went to the hardware store and bought them air conditioners. And so much more than what they were asking. And it wasn't like anything was celebrated or anyone even knew. It was just a Barnabas stepping in when somebody needed to be there, a regular, everyday, ordinary person. Uh, And I just think that when you see the difference that a lie, a genuine life of faith can make, um, I I just think there's a strange attractiveness to that, that it gives us a picture and a vision of what our own lives can be and probably should be. So number two, truths that move us toward authenticity. 
The church is not just another charitable organization. It represents the presence of the living God in the world. The church is the people in whom God lives and through whom God works. And if we are to be the people in whom God dwells, we must take life and our faith seriously. We must be particularly sensitive and aware of anything which God himself opposes. This is what it means to fear God. How many times as you've been reading the first part of Acts have you read that the early believers did what? They feared God. They were full of an awe and a fear of God. Now, some people are confused by this story because it seems contrary to the spirit of Jesus. Am I right? I mean, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus does all of these miracles and mighty acts, almost always out of compassion. But then we get to Acts, and Ananias and Sapphira pull this monkey business And this just seems so out of character for us. So if we've recreated in our minds a Jesus meek and mild, then maybe we're failing to remember that when it comes to hypocrisy and when it comes to superficial spirituality, Jesus' words can cut quite deep. Mark 11, there's a time where Jesus sees a fig tree from a distance, and the fig tree has all these green leaves on it. And Jesus walks over to it, and there is no fruit on the tree. And the point is that that's how people can be. From a distance, we look one way, but up close, it's a different story. And Jesus curses the fig tree, and the fig tree dies and withers. Or maybe you think of Matthew 23, where Jesus is addressing the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's giving them these warnings of judgment. And it's like a summer thunderstorm. It's like boom, 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 over and over again. He's hitting them with this confrontation of their unrighteousness. Or maybe you think of these stories in the Old Testament, like Joshua 7, where a man named Achan, when the city of Jericho was destroyed. Everything was to be destroyed. But he saw some gold and some silver and a really nice robe. And he kept that back and he hid it in his tent. And when he's exposed for doing that, it is disastrous. Because in this moment, when God was pouring out his blessing on Israel by giving them the land, Achan is operating out of selfishness and out of greed. Or you think of Leviticus 10, when the sons of Aaron are told, were told that they offered before the Lord, before his altar, strange fire. And the fire comes out and consumes them, and they die right there on the spot. And then Moses tells Aaron, he says, this is what the Lord said. By those who come before me, I will be treated as holy before all the people. I'll be honored. And Moses is telling Aaron, your sons did not honor the Lord. Your sons treated the Lord as something unholy. In 2 Chronicles 26, Uzziah wants to give an offering before the Lord in in the temple. And he's not a priest. He's not supposed to do that. And 80 priests come to him and tell him, you should not be doing this. And he refuses to listen to them. And he begins to burn incense, and all of a sudden he breaks out with leprosy. And we're told that he lived the rest of his days with leprosy, separated, living in a home, all isolated. Or maybe think about 2 Samuel 6, when David and Israel, they're going to move the Ark of the Covenant. And as they're moving the Ark of the Covenant, they're not paying attention to what God has said for the Ark to be moved and to be handled. And the animal pulling the cart hits a bump, and the Ark rocks, and one of the young men named Uzziah reaches out and grabs the ark, and he dies right there. And we're told that it was because of his irreverence. Now, you hear these stories, and the common denominator of all these stories is that is, is the reaction of God when he is treated flippantly, that God will that God demands a certain seriousness. These people are unserious. They have no conscience before God. 
And I think Luke includes this at the very beginning of the, of the history of the early church, at the very beginning, to remind God's people, God is not to be trifled with. God doesn't play religious games. And we may not like these stories, but we can't have it both ways. If, if you want to watch with fascination as the early church does these wonderful healings and they stand with courage against the authorities, we have to also face the fact that if you want to be the Jesus community, that's the place where the living God, that's where his presence is in the world. So don't be surprised if God takes you seriously. For God's people, holiness is not an optional extra. And though we live in a culture that is notoriously filled with spin and with smear, half-truths and manipulation, we are not those people. Pastor Tony Evans says, if you fear God, you will walk in his ways. If you fear God, you will walk in his ways. If you are serious, you will walk in the ways that God calls us to walk. In other words, he says, we fear God with our feet, not just with our feelings. We fear God with our walk, not just with our talk. We fear God with our life, not just with our lips. And if you've ever heard Pastor Tony Evans preach, he says it way better than I just said it. But as part of the church, this is what this means. We live conscious of his presence. We live conscious of God's presence. And that ought to motivate us and move us to, toward authenticity, toward realness, if you recognize the presence of the living God. How many of you, when you're driving around, say you're just going down the highway, driving the way you normally drive, however that is, whatever you deal with, with the signs on the side of the road, with numbers, or whether or not you use blinkers, that's your business, but you're going down the highway, and all of a sudden, you notice a police officer in your rearview mirror. Now, I don't know about you, but I always have both a psychological and a physical reaction when that happens to me. First thing that happens is my right foot gets a lot lighter. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not even a fast driver. I drive like a granddad, which is appropriate because I am a granddad. But that, it automatically happens. And I automatically go into my best behavior. And my hands are at 10 and 2. And I'm trying to look very responsible, checking the mirrors, all that sort of thing. And it just sort of happens. Um, because I am, in that moment, I have become conscious of that police officer's presence. And when I am conscious of their presence, I behave differently. That's just the reality of it. Now, when he peels off and goes where he's going, I go back to my normal, you know, kind of ways, right? Um, that is sort of the way we do things. Um, but what we recognize is, in our lives, there's never a time where God's presence departs from us. And so we live conscious of the presence of God. And that, that ought to not fill us with a dreadful fear. It ought to fill us with a desire to be authentic and to be real. So we move toward authenticity and toward truth. Number three, we recognize that the evil one's promise of a godly reputation without godly character is hollow and deceptive. We recognize that the evil one's promise of a godly reputation without godly character is hollow and deceptive. Satan is cunning, and he is attempting right from the start to try and pollute the church the same way he was able to pollute the temple. Distract the people from godliness by the promise of power and control and prosperity. And Ananias and Sapphira, they want a good reputation. They want the accolades of being wonderfully generous people. Uh, they, 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 want, they want to have the accolades without truly being willing to make a sacrifice. They, they want the acclaim and the affirmation. They want to be esteemed for godliness without being godly. It's a textbook case of duplicity. And they prove that they are counterfeits and not the real McCoys. And we have to hear the words that there are no shortcuts with God and there are no secrets with God. There are no locked doors or hidden closets for the Holy Spirit. 
A day will come, according to Jesus, when every secret will be proclaimed from the housetops. And I imagine Ananias and Sapphira knew this, and maybe they forgot it, or maybe they just ignored it, but they became so consumed with the praise of others that they forgot the one from whom all praise really matters. Now, I can't see inside of your heart. I can't see inside of your soul to discern whether or not you are a Barnabas or whether you are an Ananias. You, you can be a dupe, and I will probably never figure that out. Because as my wife tells me, I think everybody's Barnabas. And I'm always failing to see the Ananiases. It's not me that you're trying to fool. Um, but I, I hope that we realize that the secrets of our heart are not secrets to God. But see, this is what makes grace so good and so liberating. Because grace makes duplicity unnecessary. It makes it completely unnecessary. Because you, in, in the grace of God, you've been set free from pretending. You've been liberated from the need to impress anyone. You are living for something different. You don't have to be afraid to be real. Anne Lamont, a uh, really interesting writer, she says... If something inside of you is real, because we're afraid of the real stuff in us, aren't we? She said, if something inside of you is real, we will probably find it interesting, and it will probably be universal. In other words, the part of you that you're so afraid of, the thing that you're trying to hide, is probably the thing that most people would actually connect with you. They would actually understand you because they're experiencing the same thing. So she says, you must risk placing real emotion at the center of your life. You've got to be willing to be vulnerable. You've got to risk being unliked. If you want to be real, you've got to risk being vulnerable and even being unliked. Number four, God will not tolerate exploiting his name in order to boost our reputation or image. God will not be used. Now, in verse 3, I want you to look at this carefully. I think the translation here is very important. Let me, let me ask you a question, though. Is Ananias lying to the Holy Spirit, or is he lying about the Holy Spirit? And there may not be a huge difference between the two. Although I think the language suggests that Peter is lying about the Holy Spirit to the people. Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money? Now, let me give you another way that this can be translated. It could be translated, how is it that Satan has filled your heart to falsify the Holy Spirit. To falsify the Holy Spirit. In other words, Ananias, how are you lying about the Holy Spirit? Well, you know, the Spirit just led us to sell this property. Hey, what made y'all do that? We were just filled with God's Spirit, just led by the Lord, you know. Uh, in other words, using the Holy Spirit to bolster their status, a little Holy Ghost name drop. Oh, wow. No, no, no. Don't make it a big deal. We do this all the time. God says it. We do it. You know, we're just humble that way. See, that's sort of the, 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 the spirit that I think Peter is asking. Are you really going to falsify the Spirit of God? God does not take lightly to those who hijack his name for personal gain. And this is not terribly different from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus warns us about using God to bolster our image. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before people in order to be seen by them. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. And when you pray, don't pray standing out on the, on the street corners and in the synagogues. 
in order to be seen by others. But when you pray, go into your closet and close the door and pray to your Father. And when you fast, don't look all somber like the hypocrites who want to show everyone that they're fasting and said, comb your hair and wash your face so that it will not be obvious that you're fasting. Luther, are you trying to say that people would actually try to use God to bolster their image? Yeah, yeah, you're talking to one of them. Actually, you're not talking, you're listening to one of them. I've done it all the time, still do it, still find myself doing that. Luther, people would not use God to increase their customers and raise profits in their businesses. Would they really do that? Oh, yeah. I had a guy one time, y'all, this is a true story. Some of them are lies, but this one is true. I'm just kidding, just kidding. I have a habit of saying true story. Um, but uh, one time, a guy had, I met this guy in town, and he asked me what church I went to. I told him I'm the pastor of City Church, and he said, you know, um, I don't, I don't want to burst your bubble, but that is not a church I would ever attend. And I said, how so? Why so? And he said, he goes, I move around a lot with my job, and he goes, I always go to the biggest church. He said, I figure God is in every church. I may as well go to the church where I can get the most connections. Really said that. So yeah, yeah. People would not use God on social media to try to portray themselves as super godly. I used to say that true willpower was the power to break a chocolate bar into two pieces and then only eat one of the pieces. Um, I now say that True willpower is the power to do good in God's world and not post it on Instagram. That's where it takes real power, isn't it? See, when we realize that God will not be exploited and God will not be used, when we realize that God takes his name seriously, it ought to be a powerful motivation for us to move toward honesty, to move toward authenticity, and to move away from grandstanding and showmanship. Number five. Five choose to move us toward authenticity. Number five, we recognize that deceptive, sinful behavior inside the Christian community is more destructive and more painful than persecution from the outside. As a pastor, I believe that statement with all of my heart. And I, I worry that we are far more worried about what is happening outside the church and not worried nearly enough about what is happening inside of us. The story of Ananias and Sapphira reveals how evil and deception can manifest itself among God's people. And it can disrupt this beautiful harmony that we've been reading about for the first four chapters. All of a sudden, I mean, everything just gets submarined. So this isn't just the story about two greedy people. It is the heinous nature of, of greed and duplicity of the invasion of the community of God by the powers of darkness. A.W. Tozier, he wrote, Many a solo is sung to show off. Many a sermon is preached as an exhibition of talent. Many a church is founded as a slap to another church. Even missionary activity can become competitive and soul winning may degenerate into something to satisfy our flesh. In other words, he's saying our greatest threat, our greatest enemy isn't anyone on the news. It's in our own hearts. It's our own egos. As one writer put, says, we're all fakes. Oh, we're not all fakes all the time. In fact, we spend a good deal of our time truly and genuinely serving. But most of us would admit that the spiritual image others have of us isn't always accurate. It's a fearful thing to let others in on the real you. So you may read your Bible regularly 
and listen to Christian radio programs daily or watch Christian television religiously. You may read you know, the Christian books by the most popular Christian authors. You may go to the Passion Conference or the Women of Faith Conference every year. You may be a popular leader among Christian circles. You may feel spiritual at times, and it is possible to do all of those things as an imposter. Fake. And so how do we bring this to a conclusion? The beautiful reality about faith is that you don't have to impress God to get in the club. We don't have to climb ladders or build spiritual resumes. It actually begins exactly the opposite of those things. Not by demonstrating how awesome we are, but by admitting how broken we are. That's actually the very first thing, the very first step, not by trying to show the world how much we have, but by coming clean before God with how much we need. Amen? Amen. Amen. So can we pray together? Father, you know all things. You know the deep and the hidden things. You know the things which are true but undiscovered. You knew us when we were in our mother's wombs, and you know us now, inside and out. And so we have been set free, Lord, from pretending, because we live our lives conscious of the presence of the living God, that the cross has made a way for us to be real before you and before one another. And so, Lord, we confess our sin this morning. We confess our unworthiness. We trust our lives, our souls, our future to the one who gave himself for us and through whom we pray. And all God's people said, amen.